Well, hello again, and for those watching at the Tide and online, we want to say welcome once again. And I want to say a special thank you to Pastor Paul, who filled in for me while I was away on vacation and did so very capably. Paul, we're so grateful that you could do that and would be able to share with our congregation here. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I want to say thank you to you folks for the privilege of being your pastor. Uh, This last few weeks have just been an absolutely refreshing time. I know some people were worried because our vacation plans were quite busy, Uh, but we we made it through. We really did, didn't we, dear? (laughs) She's nodding going, "Uh uh-huh. It it worked like this. We, we, We went to five provinces, four time zones, and a time change in two weeks. And had a flat tire on the side of the 401, as she loves to remind me over and over again. My, my brother gave us a trailer. We made it to Belleville before the tire blew. So thanks, John. Anyway, yeah, if you're watching us, if you happen to be. Uh, it was actually, it really was an amazing time. It really, it really was an absolute blessing to us. Um, we had the chance to spend some time with family. We got to meet my dad's new girlfriend. She's a sweetheart, which was really a blessing to, to see. And it was encouragement to us. Time with our siblings and, and my siblings. And then uh, flew across to Manitoba and spent four days at, at one of the most amazing events I've ever had the privilege of being part of. A a church renewal conference doesn't begin to cover it. Um, As they put it, you got to taste and see. And to go to this event, uh, just just one highlight of the weekend would have been the prayer summit. My friends, there were 2,400 people in the building. There was 460 delegates like myself that had come from around the world, 17 countries and 74 denominations represented in the room. Three to 400 youth, teenagers, praying with the adults and having a great time worshiping and praying. I'll tell you what, it's a little taste of heaven, a little taste of what God can do when God's people say, you know what, we're going to love one another, we're going to love God with all our hearts, and it was just an absolute joy and privilege to be part of, and I come back just just rejoicing, because then we went from there and got on a plane and flew over to Calgary and drove over to uh, to see my son, and, and, and we, we spent a couple of days with Ben, drove over to the mountains, and that's another thing you got to taste and see. You know, if, if you've never seen the mountains for yourself, I'd never been past Ontario, okay? You know, world traveler Jeff. I've been to Florida, but I've never been west. And, and if you haven't seen the mountains, if you haven't been there and stood at the foot of them, you really, you can't, I can't explain it to you. No picture can capture it. It was just a spectacular time and so refreshing. And, and some, by some weird twist of fate, a miraculous uh, moment happened where uh, the, the, there was tourists around for a little bit when we got there, but then they all walked away. And then my family said, it's time to go. And they all walked away. And I got this moment. Maybe you know what I mean. I got this moment all by myself, standing on the dock at the edge of Lake Louise, looking up these mountains, just going, wow, God. You know, just this moment was God, like God was saying, I'm here, look what I did. And I'll tell you what, just, just such a joyful experience. To, to spend time with God that way and be refreshed. It, it absolutely were, was a, a great time for us. I mean, some of you know I was getting a little tired before I left. You might have noticed. Getting a little draggy. Getting a little bit uh, worn down. Maybe, maybe on the edge of burning out. But God is good. We've been through a challenging year. I mean, Debbie and I just, <laughs> some of you know what it's like to have empty nest, but you know, it was really challenging when my, my son moved to Alberta. It's like, suddenly I can't just go see him when I want to. I can't just go have a chat with him. And he's on a weird schedule. So he's, he's he, you know, when he called us the other night, he called us, what, it was at midnight, 1230, something like that. Says, hey, dad, I need to talk for a second. You're still up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Listen. Uh, it's been a challenging year for us as a church, and some of you have been through challenging seasons. You, you know what I'm talking about, where you've been, you've been facing some things and dealing with some stuff, and you're going, God, where are you? What are you doing? And maybe you know what it's like to be worn down. It seems to me it's pretty scary how easy it is for us when we're tired <laughs> and when we're worn down to become a little bit bitter. A little bit resentful of our situation. Maybe even a little bit resentful of what God is up to. God, why, why are you letting this happen to me again? Why are you doing this to me, Lord? There's a familiar story in the book of Ruth. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn there. And I just want to set the stage in, in, in the book of Ruth in chapter 1 and verse 1 to 5. Here's, here's the description, and I can't say it any better than the scripture said, so just listen to this for a moment. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, it says that in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. 
Has anybody here ever gone hungry? There was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah, and they went into the country of Moab and remained there. So far, not so bad. There's a famine. They go to a place where there's food. You think, hey, okay, this is all right. But then look what happens. (laughs) Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of of the one was Orpah and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years and both Malon and Chilion died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. How's that for a happy beginning to a story? I mean, clearly, things have not gone as they hoped and planned. And things are, when things go sideways, we can end up feeling exactly like in the situation here. Now, what's interesting about this story is that as we see so many times in the Bible, in the upper story, God is doing something interesting through a famine. God often uses things like famines to bring, ab- bring about change for his people or to accomplish his plans. But in the lower story, what do we see? Elimelech and Naomi, they've got two sons. They think to themselves, I am hungry. It's a famine here. We're going to fix the problem. Anybody here ever fix their own problem? (laughs) So they decide to go to Moab. Now, this is not a good place to go in that context. The Moabites are one of the pagan peoples in the land, still in the region, that worship gods other than the God of Israel. And it looks, from a simple reading of the text, it looks like Elimelech and Naomi have actually made a mistake. It's a failure in faith because they choose to leave the land that God gave them, their inheritance, their birthright, and go to another place hoping to find solutions for their problem. Now, humanly speaking, this may seem rational, but it's probably a mistake and it certainly shows a lack of faith in God at that moment. Because God didn't tell them to go, they chose to go on their own. Now, as you see from that brief introduction, there's nothing left in Moab for Naomi at this point. She's lost her husband, she's lost her two sons, now she's got these two Moabite daughter-in-laws, and she thinks to herself, I I may as well go home. She gets some good news. She hears that back back home that the famine is over, that, that maybe it's safe to return anyway, and so she decides to head out on a journey. Partway there, she looks at these two women that are with her and she she thinks to herself, this is ridiculous. God's already taken my husband. He's already taken my sons. Now these two women are going to suffer on account of me? No, no, I won't have it. So she says to them, listen, I want you to go back home and find new husbands. You're still young. You're still pretty. You can still catch a man. Go do that. Now, I'm not being trite when I say that. In those days, the only hope for a woman, for her security, for health and safety, was to have a husband who could provide for her. That was the way the culture worked in the day. And so when she says this, it's from a deep heart of caring for these two women and a concern that they're going to experience the same curse she has if they keep going with her. Naomi, at this point, believes she's been cursed by God. How else could so many things go wrong? How bad could her life get? And so what do we see them do? Well, they say at first, no, we won't do that. We're not going to abandon you. We're going to be here with you. We're going to be here for you. But a little while later, Naomi says again, no, really, you've got to go. You've really got to go. And Orpah says, okay. And she kisses her mother-in-law farewell and heads back. But Ruth says, no, I'm not doing that. I am not going to go back I'm going with you. Look at Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, if you have your Bibles open. These are the words that Ruth says. She says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. You hear the commitment? Ruth doesn't just say, I'm going to go with you. Ruth says, I'm going to go with you and your God's going to be my God and your house is going to be my house and I'm going to stay with you no matter what. And even until I die, I'm not going to leave you. Ruth is all in on her commitment to Naomi. 
And Naomi, bitter and feeling cursed and frustrated by God as, as she is, she's left with nothing else to say, so she says no more. But Naomi continues to struggle with her losses. She comes back home. Interesting, where is her home? It's Bethlehem. Her hometown, where she's from originally, is Bethlehem in Judea. This is the town where David is born, the king that is known for writing most of the Psalms in the Bible. This is where Jesus himself is born so many years later. And this happens to be in God's plan where Naomi's from. But she gets back to town and people look at her and they, they almost don't recognize her. They say, is this Naomi? Maybe you know what that like, that's like. If you've ever gone back somewhere you haven't been for years. I had that happen to me a little while back. I was at an event and a woman I hadn't seen for, oh, since 2002, so a while ago. Takes one look at me and she goes, oh, it's you, Jeff. And I said, yeah, how you doing? She said, good. I said, you look good. She said, thank you. Now, I've been proud of myself because I've lost 30 or so pounds, right? She looks at me and she goes, wow, you got fat. (laughs) So you know what I'm talking about. When they look at Naomi, they haven't seen her for a while. (laughs) You just got to go with it sometimes, right? (laughs) Thank you. I don't know what to say that. They, They haven't seen her for a while and they say, is this Naomi? And here's what Naomi says in verse 20 and 21. She says, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Just leave that verse there for a moment. Think about this. I mean, she she went hoping just to find food, just to solve a real problem. Along the way, she loses her husband and both her children. Now, a woman in those days now is considered destitute. She's going to lose everything. She, does, she can't inherit the land. She can't live on the property that belongs to her family. Nothing's going to work for her in the future. And there's no question that she is bitter, angry even, and believes that God himself has caused all this. Sometimes, my friends, our lives unfold in surprising ways. Things happen that we don't expect, or we do things that we didn't consider the consequences and they catch up with us. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we even feel like God's against us. I prayed and I did and I did and I did. I was having a great chat with my friend Sylvain just yesterday and he was saying, you gotta, <laughs> if you ever get a chance to meet my buddy Sylvain, he was the guy who voted in seminary most likely to be mistaken for Jesus. Okay. There's a reason for it. He was, he's a single dad, you know, beautiful little girl, Angel, was her name, Angelina, and, and he, he couldn't afford haircuts, so his hair was down about the middle of his back, and he had a big beard, right, just like the pictures. But I was talking to him, and he was really discouraged, and he comes out of a Pentecostal background, and it's really weird for him, because, you know, in Baptist circles, we joke about it, it's Father, Son, and Holy Scripture for us. It's not a funny joke, it's sad, but, but as a Pentecostal, he's been used to listening to God and, and hearing the voice of God in his prayer times, and it's been dry, desert-like. He's just going, God, where are you? What's going on? He's like, I, I've confessed my sin, and I prayed, and I talked to him, and I wait for him, and I listened to him, and I just don't sense God's there. What's going on? Because so much maybe seems to be going right, and yet he's in a dry place. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're somebody that's saying, listen, I'm still hurting from these wounds, these things that happened in the past. Maybe you're somebody saying, I've lost things. You don't have any idea, Jeff, how I experienced loss or what I've been through. And and you're right, maybe I don't. But the story of Ruth, I want you to see, is a story that reminds us that God loves his children and that he can redeem any situation to bring about good. It's an incredible story. Now Ruth and Naomi continue their journey. They they come back to Bethlehem and it happens to be the time for the harvest of barley. I don't know if you've ever seen a barley field. I can't say that I have. But what I can tell you is that in that context, uh, they show up really as beggars. They don't have a home. They don't have a place to go to. They just kind of camp out. And, and in the law of Israel, the way it works is when the, when the farmers go through the field and harvest, it's not like nowadays with our modern equipment. They're going out there with their scythes and cutting down the grain and then bundling it up. And the law says in Deuteronomy, 
in the Bible that anything that falls to the side, any scraps that get dropped, you're supposed to leave them there for the poor. That's how the poor people would eat, is after the farmer was done, the poor were allowed to go into anybody's field and gather up any leftovers that were in the field. And so when they get there, Naomi, who's, who's changed so much that people don't, almost don't recognize her, she's older, she's tired, she's hurting, and, and Ruth says, listen, I'm going to go out and collect some food for us. And so Ruth takes the initiative to take care of Naomi. Understand, she's a Moabite woman. These people are the traditional, if not enemies, certainly antagonistic with the nation of Israel. In order to get there, you have to go from Israel, from Bethlehem where she lives. You have to walk a long way to get underneath the Dead Sea and then come up on the other side, not under the water, but just down underneath, head south of it, and then come up on the other side and you come to Moab. They're rivals at the very least. They're antagonistic. At various times, they've been in battles together. And so Ruth, here she is, a Moabite woman, a representative from a land that's not well liked, and she shows up and she's picking grain in the fields to find food. The tension's thick. Ruth's a beautiful woman, but everybody's talking about this foreigner. Who is she? Why is she here? What's going on? And as, just like the Baptist grapevine, you know about the Baptist grapevine? It's the only thing faster than the speed of light. I'm telling you. (laughs) It's how we encourage one another. Hmm. Needless to say, the story's going around and the, and the man who owns the field show us, shows up, his name is Boaz. And Boaz, he, he shows up and he thinks, wow, wow. He's, the, the impression we have from, if you read the story carefully, is, is he immediately knows. There's a bunch, you gotta understand, there's a bunch of poor people out in the field gathering food. Not just, not just Ruth. But he immediately notices this woman. I mean, she's out there, what's she doing? She's wearing her Albert County tuxedo. She's got on her rubber boots. She's got dirt under her fingernails. She's got a smudge on her cheek. She has not brushed her hair for days. It's just in a ponytail. She's trying to survive, okay? And he still goes, who is that? Okay, this is love at first sight, okay? It's very strange, okay? Okay? Some of you are picturing Albert County Platt. I know you are. (laughs) She's out there in the field and, 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 and he sees her and now she has no idea who he is. She doesn't know he's the owner of the field. She does not, he does, she does not know at this point that, that he is actually a relative of of Naomi's family of Elimelech. and, And as such that he is what's called a kinsman redeemer. She has no idea that he actually is one of the few people in the world at that point that can change their circumstances. In fact, she doesn't see him at all. Hey, men, you know what that's like, not to be seen by the woman you're interested in? (laughs) Yeah. She's just out there gathering grain saying, I need food, I'm hungry. He's going, hubba, hubba. (laughs) Just, you gotta see this, you gotta read this story for what's there. See, Boaz, you know, he does what every every smart guy does, right? He does what every smart guy does. He says in verse 5, the Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose, this is interesting, not who is she, whose woman is this? His first question is, is she married? Does she belong to somebody? Right? Like, if you, if you pay attention, you can see this in the story. It's absolutely awesome. And what does Boaz do? As, as soon as they explain, well, she's, he's told this in verse 6. She's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And this is what Boaz says to Ruth in verse 8 and 9. Look at this. Now listen, my daughter. Strange thing to say, isn't it? But that's how you spoke in polite terms in those days. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one. But keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Again, she has no idea who he is other than apparently the owner of this field. 
But he immediately puts in place protection for her and provision for her in terms of making sure she has enough to drink. Ruth doesn't understand this. She doesn't get it. It says in verse 10, then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? And Boaz has heard the story at this point. Verse 11 and 12, Boaz answered her, all that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you've done and a full reward will be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now I want you to notice his term there. He's come under the wings of the Lord to take refuge. He's recognizing that she said to Naomi, your God will be my God. That's a decision she needed to make for God to protect her, to shelter her, to provide for her. And Ruth is absolutely overwhelmed. Verse 13, then she said, I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Listen, this all happens to her and she's just, you know, her, her, she's shocked. Again, she's dressed in her Albert County plaid. She's not all dolled up trying to catch a man. She's just trying to catch a meal, right? Like, just understand what we're seeing here. Boaz is going, whoa, I got got to find out who she is. When he finds out nobody's, he's like, okay, I got to do whatever I can to take care of her, to buy myself some time, right? He's trying to come up with his dating strategy, okay? He is. Like my dating strategy, that's my wife. Harass her until she likes me. <laughs> Look at her nodding. I thought it was great fun to scare, jump up behind a corner and scare her and make her scream. Or, or come up behind her, poke her in the ribs and make her yelp because she's very ticklish. It took a week. First, end of week one. It's a true story. End of week one after we met. She tells her roommate, I hate that Jeff guy. <laughs> 28 years this past August. You know, so I won her over. Right? We, we, we all have our dating strategy, I'm just saying. But, but, see, Boaz, he's getting himself ready. He's trying to figure things out. And so Ruth, she, she goes at the end of the day, he actually feeds her. He doesn't just let her collect the grain that's in the field, the barley that's in the field, but he actually gives her so much to eat, she's got leftovers to take home. It's like a really good Baptist potluck. It's a hint. Bring lots of food next week. And anyway, so she goes back home to talk to Naomi. And she comes, and here's the grain I gleaned, which is a fair amount. And then she says, oh, and here's the leftovers. This guy named Boaz gave it to me. And Naomi realizes what Boaz has done. Verse 20, it says this, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, this man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Again, Ruth's a Moabite. She doesn't even know what that means. But Naomi does. Man, Naomi, who's been made bitter by all her losses, starts to glimpse that maybe God is still at work. That maybe God's still trying to do something for her and for Ruth. And it's such, such an exciting moment that Naomi can't help herself. She has to play matchmaker. You know? Some of you have done that for family members or friends. You've said, I know these two need to be together and I'm going to make it happen, right? Naomi decides to play matchmaker. So we know what Ruth's been doing. She's been working as a farmhand out in the field, tromping through the mud, picking up grain, getting dirt on her face, messing up her hair, dirt under her fingernails. She needs a mani and a petty bad. I love that we can laugh together. I never have, actually. I really haven't. So what does Naomi do? Naomi says, listen, here's the plan, right? Remember, Boaz is trying to stall for time so he can can date the girl. And Naomi says to Ruth, let's shortcut the process. Here's the plan. Have a shower. 
please put on your perfume, nice outfit, and, and look, it's, it's, it's here in Ruth chapter 3, verse 3. Wash, therefore, see, have a shower, anoint yourself, put on your perfume, and put on your cloak, that's your out, you know, go to meet and kind of go to dinner kind of outfit, and go down to the threshing floor. That's where Boaz is hanging out, okay? So after they harvest the grain, they have to take it to the threshing floor and beat on it for a while to get the grain heads to separate from the stalks and the chaff and all the rest of that so they can have just the grain instead of the junk. And, and so that's where Boaz is working. He's doing a hard work. But she says, listen, let's be sneaky. Do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And he wasn't drinking Coca-Cola, Okay? After the harvest, they usually would have a feast. There'd be wine flowing fairly well. He was sleepy when he was done. Okay? Can we just own that? And then she says this, but when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. Go lay down at his feet. Uncover them and lie down. And he will tell you what to do. At this moment, Ruth needs to decide, am I going to trust what could be? Now, the truth is, and I may be wrong, but I think that in many, many circumstances, from what I've heard, you ladies are such a blessing to us men that you actually do this regularly. You set us up to do what we should have done enough to do in the first place, right? So she lies down. He's asleep. She uncovers his feet. She lies down at his feet. Well, what do you suppose wakes Boaz up? Same thing's been waking men up for years. Somebody else has the covers. Yes. <laughs> his feet are cold. And it wakes him up. <laughs> it causes him to go, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> right? And, and Naomi, who's been so bitter, told Ruth to go do this. And, and when he wakes up, he wants to say something to her. Look at Ruth chapter 3 and verse 6. She went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. Verse 8, at midnight the man was startled and turned over. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. Surprise! <laughs> you don't expect that in the barn, okay? They're at the threshing floor, he passed out because he had too much to eat and drink. We'll just assume he had turkey and it had that tryptophan in it, right? That made him sleepy. We'll go with that. Uh-huh. Everybody nod. Yes. Tryptophan. Turkey. Okay, good. <laughs> yep. He says, that's dark. It's midnight. He says, who are you? Remember before he said, whose are you? Now she's right there. He can't see her because it's dark. Who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread. Remember what we said about his blessing on her earlier? God will put his wings over you. She says, spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. You are a redeemer. And then Boaz, <laughs> he's, willing, he's willing to respond to this. He takes her and says, absolutely, but there's a problem. There's a situation we got to deal with. There's competition. Don't you hate it when there's competition? We got a love triangle already. How'd this happen? They met. He was interested. He tried to figure it out. She set it up through Naomi, so he didn't even have to figure it out. And now there's a problem. Sounds like just about every romantic comedy ever written, doesn't it? The problem is, in the law, this is how it works, in, in the law that God gave to make sure that women in a culture that didn't care about women, that didn't respect women, that didn't treat women with any grace, God said, listen, here's how it's going to work. If a woman's husband dies and there's no sons to carry on her name, we can't just let her starve. We can't just let her be abandoned. So here's what I want you to do. There will be people in the family that are in position, they're eligible to redeem that woman in her situation. And here's what they have to do. They have to be willing to pay all her debt. They have to be willing to take her as their wife. 
And they have to be willing to help her have a child, obviously in that culture, preferably a male, because then that way the line of the man who died will continue. That way they guarantee that families keep their land and that everything keeps going in the family tree the way it should. Otherwise it's cut off like cutting down a tree. And in that plan, in that law, God very clearly outlined that there are specific people that are supposed to take care of this to make sure that these women are cared for. And Boaz, who is in the line but is not number one, says, we can't cheat here. We got to do it right. And so what does he do? He goes down to the city gate. He contacts the other person who's supposed to be the redeemer for Naomi, for Naomi, And he says, listen, we got this situation. Naomi's lost her husband. She's lost her sons. We need you to redeem her. And look at Ruth chapter four, verse five. See, Boaz is smart. And he really, remember I said it was love at first sight. He really, he really wants Ruth to be his wife. So he makes a point of reminding this other redeemer of what the cost is of taking this woman on and redeeming her from her situation. He says, listen, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, in order to get her pregnant, in order she can have a son, in order her family name can continue. This is what you got to do, as well as pay all her debts. And the other guy goes, whoa, back up. I'm already married. That's going to complicate things in a big way for me. And they had this weird tradition, at least weird to us, that if you weren't willing to fulfill your job as the redeemer, you had to take off your sandal and give it to the guy that was going to. So the poor guy, he doesn't have to pay the debts. He doesn't have to take Ruth as his wife. He doesn't have to redeem Naomi. He doesn't have to pay her debts. But he does have to walk home like this, you know? Because he's not willing to do it. He's not willing to do it. But Boaz, Boaz is willing to pay the price. He's willing to pay Naomi's debts. He's willing to redeem the land that's her family's. He's willing to accept Ruth as his bride. And we get our happily ever after in the story. You know, somehow we miss this. But God's decision to give the law about redeemers was a way of telling us that this is his heart and that this is what he's going to do for all of us. That Jesus Christ is our redeemer, our kinsman redeemer, the one that looks down and says, they're in trouble, they can't pay their debt, they're all alone, they're going to be destroyed. Because their sin is overwhelming, the debt is so big. And he sent Jesus Christ to pay that price. God provided a redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. And Ruth is so blessed. to become, She becomes part, get this, she becomes part of the line of Jesus. Ruth and Boaz have a son named Obed. He has a son named Jesse. He has a son named David who becomes king of Israel. You know what's really cool? Do you know who Boaz's mom is? I didn't know this. This is so awesome. Boaz's mom is Rahab the prostitute from Jericho. Yeah. See, God redeems. God redeems. He takes people in a circumstance that we say that nobody could save them, nobody could fix that. Sometimes maybe you're the one saying, well, if you knew what I did, understand this. God is the God who redeems. He redeems Rahab, gives her an Israelite husband. She gives birth to Boaz. Boaz redeems Ruth the Moabite. And both those women get to be in the line of Jesus. See, there's no such thing as an outsider when God chooses to redeem and bring bring people into his kingdom, into his plan. But here's the problem. See, I don't know how it happened. It just happened, and I, I just was so grateful for it. We had to get back from Lake Louise in time for a dinner we were invited to on our vacation. And when I found myself standing for that moment, 
I mean, there's this beautiful wooden dock on the edge of Lake Louise and the mountains are just there and the sun's just peeking over the top and it's a bit cloudy, but that actually makes it better and there's about an inch of snow on the mountains and I can't begin to describe it well enough. And I think sometimes this is the problem when we talk about Jesus. That until, you, until you've been there and done that, you don't get what I'm, we're talking about. But I'll tell you what. I had the chance to go and see the mountains and I took it and I'll never be the same because of what God did in me and and through that moment. And I'll tell you what, if you go see Jesus, you will never be the same. If you encounter him and let him redeem you, you will never, ever be the same. Listen to how the story ends. I love how the story ends in, in Ruth chapter four. It says in verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman, the women, the same ones who said, is this Naomi? Then the women say to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Say, God will redeem your situation. God chooses messed up outsiders to accomplish his mission. Romans 5.8 tells us so, so clearly, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While, while Ruth was still a Moabite, just an outsider, didn't know anything other than that she was willing to go with Naomi. God redeemed her and changed her destiny, her destiny and her destination. But what we have to do to be redeemed is the same thing Ruth did. We have to be willing to lay down at the feet of our Redeemer and wait for him to tell us what to do. Ultimately, what do we have to do? That same thing we've done so many times and we love to sing about, we have to trust and obey. We have to trust and obey. I invite you this evening, come once again to your Redeemer, lay down at his feet, and let him tell you what the next step is. Would you pray with me? Father, I so thank you for this love story. This amazing story, it would be so easy for us just to see as Boaz and Ruth and Naomi, but God, it's a story that reminds us of how you love us, of what you will do, how far you will go to redeem your people. Father, we have debts we cannot pay. We have an inheritance that we've lost. And Father, we have no hope without you. But you sent Jesus Christ to pay that debt to redeem our inheritance, to redeem us and to restore us so that you might bless us with more than we ever imagined, to include us in part of your plan. Father, we thank you. We pray that even as we go this evening, you'd just remind us once again of your great love and how far you went to redeem each one of us. Father, if there's any here who've not yet made the decision to trust in Jesus Christ, it's so simple. I pray, Lord, right in this moment, they will simply believe in his death and resurrection and that they'll confess him as Lord. And in so doing, that they'll allow him to lead them, to, that they'll lay down at his feet and wait to hear from you. Father, you will speak if we listen. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.